All right. Well, welcome everyone to another edition of this, uh, the webinar, the monthly webinar that we host. And uh, I am new to this. I'm taking over for Ramon this month, which is kind of fun. Um, my name is Lori Nichols, and maybe you guys have seen me. I started with Media Associates International last November as the communications manager. So you may see my name around um, talking about how wonderful um, MAI is and just cheering you guys on as you're doing some great work to expand God's kingdom in different parts of the world. And we have 21, actually it was 25, 25 countries represented this today on the webinar. Um, and that's amazing to me because it's like this global scope that we have. And I hope that at some point you guys all get a chance to interact with each other as well. As you guys know, we're having Lit World coming up next April in Budapest. And I hope that you guys can join us. You can hop on our website to learn more about that. But um, today we're actually gonna be talking about podcasting. And we're talking to somebody who knows what he's doing because he's been doing it for like, I think I could say over a decade, right, Thomas? It's been, I think it's like since you were 13, you were doing something in technology at least. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are talking about how to leverage the power of podcasting today. And, um, and our guest is Thomas Umstad Jr. And Thomas is the host of two podcasts. Now, I, Thomas, I host a podcast right now called the Hero Makers Podcast. And I've been doing it for nine months and it's a lot of work. So I think this is great that you're gonna be telling people, you're gonna help helping us all of us understand kind of these four basic parts of having a podcast. Now, this is not gonna be a podcast for how to launch a podcast per se. And you have this great, um, this great podcast episode that you actually did. Um, talking more about that. So I will put a link to that in the chat for you all um, as well. But Thomas, let me introduce you. So Thomas hosts, like I said, these two great podcasts. One is the Novel Marketing Podcast. It's novelmarketing.com. I'll put that in the chat as well for everybody who's on the call today. And uh, Thomas uh, informed us that it's also the longest running book marketing podcast around. It's been going since 2013, which is amazing. That's eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one that you host is called the Christian Publishing Show that you've been doing since 2018 or so. That's called christianpublishingshow.com. It's right on that URL. And I'll put that in the chat as well later. And Thomas, you cover topics such as like creativity, writing, marketing, those kind of things. And I, I just love the fact that you're so committed to podcasting. And, and I'm personally really excited to hear about why you think it's so important for all of um, people who are trying to build a platform um, to, to get into podcasting and how we do that better. So Thomas, you're the, Thomas is the founder of Author Media, which is a family business that help authors build their platform, sell books, and then change the world with writing that is worth talking about. And you are a speaker on topics related to marketing technology. And interestingly enough, like I said, you built your website when you were 13, which is amazing. And Thomas has served as an author, a literary agent, marketing director. Um, so just kind of a, a lot of experience in many different areas. And Thomas also has his own personal website, thomasumstad.com, which we'll um, share that link as well. And uh, Thomas, maybe at some point you can also tell us which podcasts you listen to and that you have learned from. Um, so today we're going to be talking about these four primary concepts of podcasting, listening, guesting, hosting, and advertising. And uh, just a few notes for you all on today's webinar is that um, Thomas will talk for about 30 minutes or so. And then at the end, we will have time for questions. We already had a few questions that were submitted to us, which we'll um, address. But if you guys can, if you have any questions, put those in the Q&A and then the chat is comment. So questions is the Q&A. So if you, as he's talking, as his question, throw them in there and then we will get to those after Thomas gets done presenting. Um, if you guys can't join us for this whole webinar, then we are recording it. And so it'll be available tomorrow on our U YouTube channel as well. So without further ado, Thomas, um, I wanna welcome you. Welcome to this uh, webinar and uh, take it away. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And uh, let me know if you can see my slides. I should say how to leverage the power of podcasting. So um, Lori did such a good job 
uh, introducing me. There's not a whole lot to say <laughs> about myself. Uh, but one thing I do want to point out is that I did host a drive time radio show here in Austin for a time. And so uh, I've not just been a guest on other people's podcasts and a host of my own podcast, but I was also a, uh, both a host and a guest on lots of radio shows. So I've spent uh, a lot of time on both sides of the microphone. And I've learned a lot of things the hard way. I want to share some of those hard learned lessons with you. And I hope that you can learn from my mistakes <laughs> and not make them yourself. Uh, but I'd like to open with a story. It's about this guy, his name is Scott Sigler, and his books didn't fit into any category. They weren't normal uh, science fiction. They were medical books, but they were, they were almost like medical horror books. They He would write about things like pandemics, but this was like, 15 years ago when everyone's like pandemic what's that uh and he got as he was writing 50 rejection letters and he kept writing and then he got 50 more rejection letters okay so i want you to imagine pitching your book to 100 publishers and continuing to go well he finally decided you know what i'm going to podcast my novel and so he uh, would record a chapter every week and read it into his microphone and he would get feedback from listeners, and listeners really enjoyed it. He was able to find the readers. The publishers didn't think there was an audience for his book, but it turned out that there was an audience for his book. And so then when he was done, he did a final draft based off of the listener feedback, and he incorporated some of his super listeners' names into the book, if they had, and perhaps if they had donated, if they had left lots of comments. And just as a fluke, he's like, you know what, we should put this on an ebook. Let's put this on Amazon just to see, you know, the book he'd already given away for free on his podcast. He posted to Amazon. He did it on April 1st, kind of as a joke. And it became the number seven best selling book on all of Amazon in all categories because of how big his podcast audience was. Well, Penguin Random House, which had rejected him at least once, was like, hmm, this book maybe has legs. So they reached out to him, offered him a five book deal, I think for a $100,000 advance, if I'm not mistaken. And they then published his later books, and uh, which went on to become New York Times best-selling books. So he went from 100 rejection letters, and literally no one would take his book, to a deal with one of the biggest publishing houses in the world. And I remember walking into a Barnes & Noble, which is one of the big bookstores here in America, and facing the door was a Scott Sigler book, which is the premier uh, placement. It was in the special table of like featured best-selling books was this book that had been rejected 100 times. Uh, another story real quick. This guy's name is Mike. He's a fishmonger uh, with a passion for history. And uh, in 20, 2007, uh, he started podcasting. Uh, he was talking into a $60 microphone with some free editing software. And each week, he would tell a little bit of the Roman story. So he's telling us the history of Rome, the Roman Empire. And you're like, Gosh, that doesn't sound like a very interesting topic. But for some people, some of you listening, you're like, ooh, Rome, I, I would love to listen to a podcast about that. And his podcast about Rome ended up getting over 100 million downloads. Wow. So for some comparison, that is greater than the population of Texas and the population of California combined, <laughs> if, if everyone listened one time. Uh, and then <clears throat> he went on to write a book. Now, this book is not about the famous Romans. It's not about Caesar and Cleopatra and Mark Antony. It's about Marius and Sulla and the Gracchi brothers. When he was putting together his competing books for his book proposal, the nearest, most recently published competing book was over 100 year old, years old. Right? These are not famous Romans. This is um, a, a different era of Roman history, a, a history when before the empire, when Rome was just a republic. And so this book about these obscure Roman characters also became a New York Times bestseller. Now, Mike Duncan is not a history major. He studied liberal arts in college. And he doesn't have a master's in history. He doesn't have a PhD in history. But when Netflix does a documentary about Roman history, who do you think they put on their documentary now? The most famous Roman historian uh, in the world. Why is he the mo more famous than all the guys with PhDs? Because he's the one started a podcast and the podcast has put him on the map and uh, he's now uh, just about to come out with his second book uh, which is on a totally different era of history based off of his new podcast and it's likely also going to become a New York Times best-selling book so you may be wondering how how did these podcasts 
get so many downloads? How did a guy talking about Roman history find 100 million downloads? Why was it such a success? Well, I will tell you, it's not because Mike was a celebrity or had lots of experience. It wasn't because he had connections uh, and it wasn't because he had the right kind of degree. I think that his success was for the following reasons. One is that attention spans are growing. Anyone who tells you that people have an attention span of a goldfish, what you'll never hear them give you afterwards is any evidence for why that is the case. Uh, the reality is, is that movies are getting longer. People are watching movies and TV shows online for more amount of time, right? There was no term binge watching in the 1980s. Now it's something that everybody does. In a 140 character world, people long for substance. So much so that even Twitter has had to adapt and allow for more than 140 characters. Uh, we're no longer in this world of short, vapid conversations. Uh, podcasting is more powerful than you realize. Now, real quick, we need to talk about what is a podcast. So let me talk about things that are not podcasts. This is not a podcast. What Lori and I are doing is not a podcast. <laughs> this, uh, webinars are not podcasts. Facebook Live is not a podcast. Uh, those of you watching in the future on YouTube, you're still not doing a podcast. <laughs> Internet radio is also not a podcast. So what actually is a podcast? What makes it so special? What makes it so different? Well, one way to think of it is podcasts are like a DVR for audio. It's your ability to listen on demand. So if it's live, it can't be a podcast. Uh, another way to think of it is to subscribe to a podcast, you need a podcast app on your phone. And this is uh, one of the big differences when it comes to podcast listeners. There's the haves and the have nots. And there are people who have the app on their phone and they know how to use it. And the have nots who don't have the app on their phone and they don't know how to use it. Now, all iPhones come with a podcast app out of the box. So you take your iPhone out of the box, you unwrap it, there's a little purple icon that says podcast. Uh, for Google phones, for Android phones, you actually have to go into the Google Play Store and download an app. And that extra step uh, results in slower adoption of podcasts uh, amongst Android users. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, now, you may think, oh, well, I'm in a country where almost everyone uses Android. Nobody in my country has an iPhone. This is actually a good thing for you. <laughs> so um, in the United States, there's already really established podcasts, and it's really hard to break in to get your podcast known because the listeners have already made their listening decisions, and you kind of have to convince someone to either add you to their already crowded subscription list or to drop somebody else. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're in a country where people are just now discovering podcasts because they had, they're just now downloading the app, when somebody just downloads the app for the first time, they have a blank list of podcasts to listen to, which means getting on that blank list is really easy. <laughs> you're, you're facing much less competition. And so um, this is actually potentially a good thing for you, especially if you're podcasting outside of English. Um, because English podcasting, we all have to compete with those British accent people. <laughs> they have those beautiful accents and they can, they can podcast from England and, and everyone prefers to hear their accent. Uh, whereas in a lot of local languages, there's a lot of room at the top still uh, in, in non-English languages. Um, the technology behind RSS is this magical orange icon. You've probably seen it on the internet. You may not know what it means or what it symbolizes. I will explain it in a moment. So stick around because uh, this is perhaps the most important technology on the internet, uh, the new, new technology on the internet. It's the technology that represents freedom uh, and freedom of speech. It's a very, very important technology and it's behind podcasts. Uh, all right. So why do people listen to podcasts? Well, podcasts are a great way to learn new things. They allow you to turn your car into a classroom or turn your bus into a classroom. I feel like if you're on the train now, uh, everyone's got their headphones in, right? It used to be everyone was talking to each other. Uh, now everyone's listening uh, on their headphones and many of them are listening to podcasts. Uh, podcasts fill the lonely places uh, with of the day with friendly voices. Uh, people are turning off the TV and playing podcasts instead. Uh, so in, in the States, most podcast listening actually happens at home. And so that background, the TV that used to be running in the background, people are turning that off and they're playing podcasts instead. Uh, so why are podcasts so powerful? Well, focus for one. Uh, 
podcasts are a narrow cast rather than a broadcast. Uh, so the technology of radio means that in any given region, there can only be about 100 radio stations because uh, if radio stations are too close to each other on the dial, you get static. And you've probably heard this. We're trying to listen to one station every once in a while another station is coming through. Um, radio is really limited. And since there's only 100 stations, and if you're nearby another major city, fewer than that, right? So Dallas has 50 stations and Fort Worth has 50 stations. They, they have 100 together because they compete with each other. And, um, and so if you want to make a radio station work, it's got to be appealing to at least 1% of the population or more, right? You really are trying to get as big of a wedge as possible. Uh, you would never have a radio station covering the history of Rome. <laughs> it's too narrow of a topic. And yet that narrow topic, while it may not have been popular in any one city, if, since it's able to reach all of the cities, it had no trouble getting to 100 million downloads because there are a lot of fans of Roman history. Another powerful element of podcasting is that it's very recent. You can respond to a changing world. Uh, you can cover breaking news with a podcast. It's not real time, it's not live, but it can be pretty close to it. You can record a podcast and put it up immediately that same day. But uh, what's what I really like about podcasts is that it also has depth. Um, in a world full of trivial online conversations, podcast offers the exact opposite an in-depth, substantive conversation. Uh, and this is why high-status people are so drawn to podcast listening. And when you listen to a podcast interview, one of the most common phrases you'll hear is, I agree with you, or that's a good point, which is the opposite of what you get watching television news. <laughs> right? Television news is all about people yelling. I mean, I don't know how it is in your country, but in my country, uh, it's people, it's heads, they have one on the left, one on the right, and they just shout at each other. And then they play commercials, and then they get back and they shout at each other some more. And um, there's no depth to the conversation. It's very superficial. Whereas on a podcast, uh, you can't shout at each other for three hours, <laughs> but they can do a podcast. And after three hours, often they find some things that they agree with or agree on. Uh, and then the other thing that makes podcasting special is autonomy. Uh, most of the new technologies that we use aren't actually technologies, they're companies. In the name of the technology, in the name of the co in the company that is that name, has full control. So Facebook isn't a technology; it's a company. And if Facebook doesn't like what you have to say, it can completely shut you down. Twitter is a company, and Instagram is a company. Actually, Instagram is Facebook. <laughs> uh, uh, there's only a handful of companies, and they're very powerful, and they have a lot of control over what is said. But there are older technologies like RSS that is not a company. This is an open technology that nobody controls. Creators have full control over what they make and listeners have full control over what they listen to. So if you're in a country that doesn't like Christians, it's very difficult for the government to cut off listeners access to the podcast. Now, it is possible. And so um, countries with a, like a great firewall, like with China, where they cut off a lot of access to the internet, where you don't have access to the open internet, can break it off. But in most other countries where you do have open access to the internet, you have basically unlimited access to podcasts. So even um, if the companies are censoring you, um, the technology is not. And the other thing I want to point out real quick is that podcasting is not a fad. Uh, there are many fads that have come and gone since podcasting began. And podcasting has stayed around. Podcasting is older than Facebook. Before Facebook, podcasting was. So podcasting goes back arguably, uh, or at least to 2006. That's when they started tracking, uh, Statista uh, started tracking the, um, or I said, excuse me, it's Edison Research with their um, infinite dial has been tracking podcasting since then. Some of there are earlier podcasts that go back even longer than that. But podcasting goes back to like the Napster, uh, MySpace days of the internet. So with that said, <clears throat> Let's talk about four ways that you can use podcasting to become more powerful, how uh, you can leverage that power. And the first is as a listener. So let's talk about the best ways to listen to podcasts. I recommend, uh, or for, step one is to download an app. And I recommend if you're on Android, CastBox. So just type this in, or somebody maybe can post it to chat, CastBox. It's a free app, and it's a very solid app for listening to podcasts. For, for iPhone, even though Apple 
phones come with the Apple Podcast app built in. I don't actually like that app very much. It's not very well built. And it's just in the last few weeks, it's gotten very buggy. And the app that I use is Overcast, which is a much better made app. Um, and it has a lot more power. You can put your podcast into categories. It's like I have a category of podcasts that my wife likes. So if I'm in the car with my wife, I can play podcasts from that category. And then I have a category of news, that's, you know, kind of breaking news I'll listen to first thing in the morning. And it's just a more robust. Um, it also has really high privacy features, which I really like. So you've downloaded the app onto your phone and you can do that right now. I give you all permission to pull out your phones. If you're not yet a podcast app user, pull out your phone right now and do a search either for Overcast or for CastBox, depending on which platform you're on and download the app because it's going to change your life forever once you have access to the world of podcasts. So step two is to search in the app for the podcast that you want to listen to. So you can do a search for either a category. So you're like, I'm looking for writing podcasts or publishing podcasts, or you can do a search for specific podcasts. Um, so some po great podcasts to start with uh, for writing. I have two, which Lori already mentioned, Novel Marketing and The Christian Publishing Show. If you write fiction, I really like Writing Excuses, which is perhaps the best fiction writing podcast. It's, it's by some top novelists who share all of their secrets. Uh, Jeff asks about um, certain countries like Iran um, to and, and how to subscribe. I don't know about Iran specifically. I don't know that Iran has a, kind of a weaker version of the Great Firewall of China. The easiest way to get around even the Chinese firewall is with, with what's called a VPN, a virtual private network. You put the VPN on your phone that gives you an encrypted tunnel out of the country, and then you have full you have access to the open internet once you get out of the country. Um, okay, so so you do the search for the podcast, and somebody asked about the Roman history. The that podcast is called the History of Rome. Uh, so then you subscribe to the podcast, and then this is the most important step. You can't skip this final step. You have to actually listen to the podcast. <laughs> um, and now you have the power to learn anything you want. So that's listening to podcasts as a listener. I imagine most of you have already listened to podcasts. If you've only listened in your browser, you're really missing out. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, get one of these apps. All right. So the second way to leverage the power of podcasting is as a guest. So guesting gives you the influence of others. Uh, and which is really great because other people can listen to your podcast. Sorry, I have a, get a visitor. This is my daughter, Mercy. Can you say hi to everybody? Hi, <laughs> hi Mercy. I'm, yeah, I'm doing a video right now. So I need to let you, so I need to let you go. Okay, can you go find mommy? Well, mommy <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, they're not used to me uh, recording this early in the morning. It's like, why is Daddy in his office? <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, guesting on somebody else's podcast is kind of like Captain America bar borrowing Thor's hammer. It's it's somebody else giving you their power, their influence, uh, kind of like Lori and Ramon and uh, John are doing for me right now. Right? They've introduced me to their audience, and they're hoping that I provide something valuable. Uh, to the audience, or at least a uh, video of my very cute daughter, <laughs> at the very least. Um, and so guesting is a really great way to get the word out about your book. In fact, potentially even better than hosting your own podcast, uh, because it allows you to reach new audiences. Every guest interview that you do reaches a different audience. So you're going to reach more people faster. So if you're trying to spread the word about something, guesting is better than hosting. When you host a podcast, you have a really in-depth relationship with a smaller group of people that hear from you every week. But when you guest, every week you're reaching a new group of people. It's a, it's a, one way to think of it is it's the difference of being an itinerant pre preacher where every Sunday you're in a different church as opposed to being a pastor where every Sunday you're in the same church. Um, guesting gives you uh, access to influencers you couldn't reach otherwise. There are people who are very busy and often very powerful people are very busy 
And if you want to reach those powerful people, sometimes the only way to do it, to get around all the gatekeepers, is to get into the podcast that they listen to as a guest. It's also really good proof of platform for traditional publishers. You know, like I've been on these podcasts, you give them the list of podcasts, and they've agreed to have me back on when my um, show is ready, when my book is ready. And that's very impressive to publishers. So a couple of quick tips if you want to be a guest on podcasts. One is listen to a full episode of the show before you come on as a guest. Uh, don't say, uh-huh, while the host is speaking. This is one of the big things you have to learn. Um, it makes sense in a conversation. Somebody's talking, you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that becomes very jarring in earbuds for listeners. So instead, just nod. <laughs> or if you're not doing video, just, just be quiet. It's okay. <laughs> and then the strategy here is to trade up the chains. You start with small, new podcasts with very few listeners. You use those to get practice and credibility to get bigger podcasts, which then helps you get to radio shows and ultimately onto TV. And you can go to podcasthostdirectory.com uh, to get email addresses of over 100,000 podcasters. So if you're wanting to reach a specific podcaster, this is a, a resource that we built, actually. It's a part of our podcast. It's one of the perks of being a patron of the Novel Marketing Podcast. And it gives you this search engine to so type in a category or a podcast and it gives you a list of podcasts so in this case you type in romance uh, and then you just uh, click show contact info and it will give you the email address and website of that podcaster uh, the next tip is to buy a real microphone so uh, nothing gives you credibility like having good audio it's perhaps the most important thing um, as a podcast guest and uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a real microphone. You just need a kind of a guesting level microphone, but you do need to, I do recommend that you spend some. Don't rely on your laptop's microphone or your webcam's microphone. It's not going to give you a professional sound. You're going to sound um, unprofessional and it really undermines your credibility. So the microphone that I recommend is the Samson Q2U podcasting kit. It's about $60 USD. It's made in China. It's a really well-made microphone. Uh, very, very rugged, very good sound for the money. And um, it can plug directly into your computer. So it's really easy to use. And it comes with a little stand. I have a gear guide that's a free guide on um, podcasting gear that you can get at podcast.parts. It's a brand new uh, domain I just got. So just go to podcast.parts. I have uh, gear guides at all different price points uh, of, of specific uh, equipment that I've tested. Uh, second thing that you want to get is real headphones. You'll notice that Lori and I are both wearing headphones. Now, I'm wearing the big over-the-ear kind that are big and bulky, and she's wearing the more discreet in-the-ear kind. But they both have the benefit of trapping the audio around the ear. Why do you want to do that? Well, if you're not doing that, the audio comes out of your speakers and into your microphone, and then out of your speakers and into your microphone, it creates an echo uh, or a high-pitched ring. Uh, but whatever it does, it creates bad audio. <laughs> so you want to use real headphones and if uh and i recommend the samsung sr350s but really any kind of headphones are going to be better than no headphones but these are the best uh, studio monitor headphones i've found for 15 dollars. they're not the best headphones in the world but they're the best cheap headphones in the world <laughs> um okay so one other quick tip is to talk past the microphone you don't want to talk straight into the microphone like this because you get the Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Uh, now this microphone's got a shock mount or a um, pop filter built in, so it's not quite as bad, but it, it's very poppy when you talk straight into the microphone. So what instead, you want the microphone to be this microphone, you want it to be about four fingers away from your mouth and you want to be um, have it in an angle. So it's getting the sound waves, but it's not getting the wind. And if you do this, especially if you get this close, you're going to get a much better, uh, more dynamic sound uh, with what's called the proximity effect. Uh, I have a course on how to get booked as a podcast guest that you can get at authormedia.com if you're wanting to learn more about this. There's a lot to be said. I also have a bunch of episodes on it, also at authormedia.com. All right, so we talked about being a listener. We talked about being a guest. Now let's talk about being a host. Here's the crazy thing about being a podcast host. Your subscribers will spend more time listening to your voice than they will to their own mother's. <clears throat> That is a lot of influence, um, and it takes it, it, it. You need to take it seriously if, if you're going to have that level of influence in someone's life. 
So as, as you're getting started, I recommend you keep your episodes focused and short. And I'm a big believer in learning how to do a 15 minute episode before trying to do a 30 minute episode. I think a common mistake that a lot of people make with their podcasts is they jump into doing hour long episodes. And it's really hard to hold someone's attention for an hour. It's also a lot of work to record an hour's worth of audio and to edit an hour's worth of audio. Um, and so what you wanna do instead is first be faithful in the little things and then go for more things, uh, for, for longer things. So be faithful with a 15 minute show before trying to do a 30 minute show. Uh, when I started Novel Marketing Podcast, for the first several years, we really tried to keep the episodes to 15 minutes. And it wasn't until our, um, we started experimenting with longer formats and, and getting listener feedback for a longer show that we finally um, expanded the length of the show a little bit. Uh, another tip is to focus on thrilling a specific audience first. This is more important, I would say, in English language podcasting, where you have you pick a really narrow target. So it's a book marketing podcast specifically for novelists, which is what novel marketing was in the early days. Now we're for all writers. But in the early days, it was specifically for fiction. If you're um, podcasting in uh, a, a less, um, not one of like the top four or five languages, so it's not Spanish or Mandarin or, or English, Chinese language podcasts are really, really big, surprisingly. So uh, if that's already narrowing your audience. If, if you're you know, uh, podcasting in a fairly smaller language, uh, you can, I think, get away with being a slightly broader topic. Uh, but you've got to, uh, fo- you still have to focus specific people. Uh, and this is really the key to success. You need to know who your listeners are and focus on thrilling them. And once I got patrons for my podcast where I interacted with them regularly, and I was really trying to thrill those handful of people, that's what caused me to get more listeners, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, I also recommend that you listen to at least 20 different podcasts before starting your own to get a feel for different kinds of shows and listen to at least 100 episodes. Uh, so if, if you are downloading the app right now during this talk and you haven't really listened to podcasts before, maybe you've listened to some on some browsers, or you've watched some on YouTube, but not real podcasts on a podcast app, don't jump right into doing a podcast. It takes a little while to get familiar with podcasting. And I recommend listening to podcasts on podcasting. So Laura's like, give us your podcast recommendations. Here's three really good podcasts on podcasting. Build a Big Podcast is all about how to get more listeners. Podcraft is all about um, equipment and gear and how to sound better on on your budget, which I really like. And then Podcast News uh, or Pod News is, uh, podnews.net is excellent source of podcasts podcasting news. And the host of that is not an American. So he gives a a very nice kind of global perspective on podcasting, which is really good. Uh, Another thing I would encourage you to do is to be creative with your format. A lot of people just assume that podcasts are interviews where you bring on guests and you interview them. And this is the most overdone format. There are a lot of formats that are more interesting than this. And I would encourage you to explore those, especially when you're first starting off with your podcast. So this man here's name is Dave Ramsey, and he just passed 1 billion downloads. So he has one of the most popular podcasts in the world, and he's a Christian. And his show is all about giving financial advice to people. And instead of bringing on guests who he interviews, he is the expert, and his listeners are his guests. It's what I call a reverse interview podcast, where people call him up and ask him questions. Now, his approach to getting out of debt and, and managing money can fit on a napkin. He has six baby steps. They're very simple. And yet each person's story is unique. And so you get to hear somebody's story and how they got into debt. And then he, get, he helps them know which baby step is the right baby step for them. And it's been downloaded one billion times, which is a big, big number. Um. So uh, I also recommend before you host your own podcast to be a guest on several podcasts to get a feel for it. Um, starting a podcast a little bit like getting a puppy. It's a, lot, it's a lot of fun at first, but it's a lot of responsibility over time. And so you want to know, uh, you know, babysit somebody else's dog for a weekend before you get your own dog. See if this is something that you really wanted. Uh, we, I, I grew up with birds. I was like, oh, it may be nice to have a bird, a cockatiel. Uh, and so we babysat my uh, family's bird. They went on vacation. So for a few days, they left their bird with us. 
And at the end of those few days, I no longer wanted a bird and neither did my wife. <laughs> we were cured of, because we realized what, what was involved. Uh, I also recommend buying a host microphone. So the, the microphone I start, I have three different levels of microphones in my gear guide, but the kind of best bang for the buck microphone right now, and it's a brand new mic that just came out a couple months ago, is the Samson Q9U. It's made by the same company that makes the Samson Q2U, but it's a broadcast style mic. And it can plug into a mixer, but it can also plug in via USB. It's got a USB-C uh, outlet on the back or jack on the back, and it can plug in either USB-C or USB-A. Um, and it's a, it's a, gives you a good full bodied broadcast sound and it's got the built in pop filter. But I will say, I know a lot of people who host their podcast with that Q2U, the one I recommended earlier, uh, that's only uh, $80, sometimes cheaper. So again, go to podcast.parts if you want to download my guide. It's nine pages of, of tips uh, and, and different gear for different situations. Okay, final section, then we'll go to your questions. I see you've sent in a lot of qu questions. Um, so podcast advertising is the fourth area. Uh, if you spent $1,000 on ads and you got the average return on investment for podcasting, this is according to the International Advertising Bureau did a study uh, where they looked at 532 campaigns across 232 brands. They found that on average, $1,000 Dollars spent on podcast ads returned two thousand four hundred and twenty dollars. So it's an immediate return on investment. Podcast advertising has one of the highest return on investments of any kind of advertising, and this is particularly true for books. If and this is a really important if, if you have an audiobook, so uh, don't pay to advertise on podcasts if you don't yet have an audiobook. You can get an audiobook for free. Uh, there are websites where that will um, match make you with narrators who will narrate your book in exchange for a, a share of the royalties. It costs you no money up front. There's no reason not to have an audiobook of every book you make. Um, and uh, we can talk about audiobooks if you want. ACX and Findaway Voices are the two uh, matchmaking sites that will help you get an audiobook reader. But because podcast listeners prefer to listen, uh, you're leaving a lot of money on the table if you advertise a paper slash ebook on a podcast. Uh, you want to get what's called a host read ad, which is where the host uh, in their own voice uh, reads the ad for your book. Ideally, they've read your book or they're, they're recommending it. Um, and you may, if, if you're on a small budget, you may want to reach out to podcasts that don't yet have ads that are kind of mid-level to small level podcasts because they're going to be cheaper and potentially easier to work with. Uh, and this is where the podcast host directory actually also can be very helpful because having the email address of a podcast that doesn't normally host ads, but it's a perfect fit for your audience uh, can be really good. And you may be really surprised how effective this is as a marketing tool. So I have one final question, uh, story, but before we go to that story, I'd like to go to some of your questions. Um, so Lori, do you want me to just read off the question and then answer it? Or do you want to feed me the questions? How do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you're comfortable reading them yourself, go ahead. Okay. okay. I, um, I, ha I'll j I guess I'll just take them in the order they were sent in. So here's a question from uh, Joe. He says, do you have a reference for a trend towards long form content? I have a feeling it's true, but would love some data as to whether it skews towards a certain age groups. Um, some of the most popular podcasts are long form. The Joe Rogan Show, which is no longer a podcast, it's a show because it's only on Spotify, but it's still very podcast-ish, um, can be two or three hours long. And it's very popular with young people. But that can be misleading because Joe Rogan has done 1,500 episodes. He started podcasting in 2005, and he's learned how to hold someone's attention for two hours. So just because he's able to do it, and before that he hosted TV shows, and he has a lot of experience with media, stand-up comedy. Uh, doesn't mean that that's what you should jump in right away. It's like before you run a marathon, you have to first run, learn how to run a 5K, right? If you can't run a 5K, you can't run a marathon. Um, but uh, kids listen to lots of long form stuff. Like the go-to thing for young people right now is Twitch. Um, and they're watching hours and hours of people playing Minecraft on Twitch. And it's like, this is not engaging content. And yet 13 year olds will watch it for hours. And, and they're talking about politics and all kinds of stuff while they're doing that. Um, 
our perception of the kids is very different from the reality of the kids. And if you don't believe me, go watch PewDiePie, who's the number one YouTuber with young people around the world, uh, with the possible exception of India, and uh, watch his 45 minute discussion on Plato's Republic. <laughs> and until you've watched that video, you won't understand the kids these days <laughs> because they're not what you think. Uh, and then look at how many views he has on his 45 long, 45 minute long discussion on Plato's Republic. It's over 5 million views uh, from kids talking about Plato's Republic, nine-year-olds. Uh, all right. Joe asks, I'd love to know some of the most common ways people discover new podcasts. Um, the number one and number two way are hearing about it on other podcasts, which is why guesting is such an important strategy. If you're a if you launch a podcast, you want to be guesting on a lot of podcasts to get people on your podcast. And then word of mouth is the other way. And then probably advert uh, offline advertising, like advertising and podcast apps would be number three after that. Um, M Mathoni, uh, Mercy, ah, Mercy is my daughter's name, <laughs> uh, asks, uh, with the pandemic, is there a way to do a podcast interview with someone away in another location, like on the phone? Yes. Uh, you can do it on Zoom, uh, which is the easiest way, but not the best. Zoom audio is not great. Um, what I recommend, there are three uh, apps that do really high quality remote recording. Uh, Zencaster, which has a free version, Squadcast.fm, uh, and Riverside.fm. I've used all three. I like all three. I currently use Riverside. And I think Riverside is the cheapest for the paid versions, but they're all good. And I would just compare them and see which one fits best for your needs. They, they have slightly different features. Uh, but what they do is they do what's called a double ending recording where both sides are recording locally. So both sides sound like they're in studio, which is uh, the most hospitable way to host a podcast. That way, if your guest has a good microphone, they're going to sound like they were in the studio with you. So my podcast, when I have guests on, and I don't have a guest every episode, but when I do, the guests uh, sound like they're in the uh, studio because I only bring on guests that have good microphones and I use Riverside.fm to get a good local non-compressed uh, recording. Uh, telephones are complicated and the lowest quality. So they're, they're the worst of both worlds. They, they're the most work to record somebody on the telephone for you as the host and you get the lowest fidelity sound. So I wouldn't record on a phone. Um, and you can keep uh, putting in questions if you still have questions I haven't answered yet. Um, here's another one. From uh, is there an advantage to a host a, to host a podcast on your website in addition to being hosted on the common hosting platforms? Ah, so this is an important uh, distinction. Um, since podcasting is not a company, it's a technology, it has to be hosted on your website or somebody's website in order to be on the other platforms. So you don't upload your podcast to Spotify you just uh, submit your RSS feed to Spotify one time, and then all new episodes that you add to your website or to your podcast host automatically get added to Spotify. And um, same with all of the other directories. Uh, so you can have your cake and eat it too. So if you go to authormedia.com, you'll see that we have an episode of the Novel Marketing Podcast, and we have a blog post version of the episode, which we call the show notes. So we have the blog post version, and we have um, the audio version right there on the website, but you can also go to iTunes or Spotify and listen to the audio versions there as well. So this is one of the great things about podcasting is that it can be in a bunch of different forms for a bunch of different people. Uh, so uh, Adna says, does Spotify work as well? Yes. In fact, in some countries, uh, Spotify has got more market share in podcasting than Apple does. And Spotify has been the go-to way of Android users into the podcasting ecosystem. Uh, I don't trust Spotify as a company. And so it's why I don't recommend them. But our, my podcast is on Spotify. So you can listen to it on Spotify. I do recommend that you submit your podcast to Spotify, but I wouldn't go all in. I wouldn't use Anchor as your host and I wouldn't use Spotify as like your only delivery mechanism. I don't think that they're our friend. Um, and there, there's some things that they're doing that are, are very suspicious uh, to me, but uh, you can use it. 
Um, all right, here's another question. Uh, if I don't like my voice slash accent, is it advisable to get a voiceover artist to record for me? Let me tell you a secret. Nobody likes their voice. <laughs> and there's a scientific reason for this. Um, when you hear everyone else, you're hearing their sound going through airwaves that echoes in your ear chamber inside of your ear. When you hear yourself, you're not hearing yourself that way. You're actually hearing the vibrations of your voice echoing through the skeletal structure of your skull and into your ear. So you hear yourself in a more resonant, more nuanced way than anyone else hears you. And you just have to get over that. Everybody, it's jarring to hear your voice from a speaker because it sounds so different from how your voice sounds to yourself. Um, and you just got to get over it. It just takes practice. Uh, and realizing that you're there to serve, it's not all about you. <laughs> and your authentic uh, self is going to be more compelling and interesting to your listeners. Now, if your accent is hard to understand, um, you may want to, that's a little bit different because people do need to understand you to be able to engage with your content. And so you may work on leveling the accent or, or, or negotiating that. But if it's that you have a regional accent or a class accent that is um, not favored. So in some parts of the world, there's like the accent of the wealthy people and there's the accent of the poor people. And so you have the accent of the poor people. Use your accent. That voice, that, that accent needs to be heard. Don't buy into this world that only the wealthy get to speak. That is a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And it's... it's um, against the teachings of the Bible, right? It's like if you, uh, I think it's Paul talks about in Corinthians about not putting the rich people in the front row of the church and like giving them like special status. Don't do that in your podcast either. And don't don't buy into, I'm ranting here. Use your own voice, Mathoni. I, I think it's great. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ida asks, uh, what's the advantage or disadvantage of being uh, on a podcast network? Uh, being on a podcast network is a great way to give some of the money that you're earning to somebody else. <laughs> I don't know if there's any advantages uh, for most podcasts. Um, the, uh, it, uh, the, the typical advantage is that it help, makes it easier to sell advertising. Um, because uh, maybe you're not big enough to sell ads directly on your show, but collectively you're able to sell ads for your show. You get a sales team. Most podcast networks, though, don't provide a sales team and they don't do a very good job selling ads. Um, and so I don't often recommend podcast networks. Uh, I, I recommend that you stand on your own feet, but there are exceptions. Um, Ali says, if you write books on different topics, should you start a podcast on each book topic or find one common or favorite theme? Um, so uh, I'm going to put on my book marketing hat here for a second and actually say, uh, you're going to sell more copies of your books if you're willing to narrow your focus for your books. If your books are all over the map, you're really going to struggle with your brand and with finding an audience for each new book. Um, so I recommend pruning. Uh, so instead of letting the bush grow wild, prune it and prune your writing and really focus on a specific audience and filling them in a specific way. Um, doesn't mean you have to write the same book over and over again, though. So you can um, uh, find that common theme, but you want to try to make that common theme as narrow as possible. Uh Oh, here's a good question. Allie asks, what is your crafting process per episode? Does it get easier as you go? Um, it's actually gotten harder. <laughs> uh, so I put more work into it. I, I put a lot more work into each episode now than I did when I first got started. Um, so when I first got started, we just kind of put together some talking points. I had a co-host and we sometimes would determine who would talk on each talking point and we just kind of riffed on those talking points. Now, um, for my solo shows, I have a, kind of a, a really in-depth outline. It's almost like sermon notes for the presentation. And I do a lot of research and a lot of preparation um, b before the episode. But how here's the process. So I have one document just of ideas, you know, of topics and episode ideas, and also of questions that come in from listeners. So you have to come up with your first 50 or so episodes on your own. And then hopefully by then, all the, most of the episodes after that are topics that your listeners give you. And right now we have more ideas coming in for my show than we have episodes going out. So I have kind of an unlimited number of topics to cover. And so I, as the ideas come in, I put them on the episode idea doc. 
is what I call it. And it's a special Google Doc. And then when I need to come up with an episode topic for the week, I go to the idea doc if I don't already have one burning. Um, sometimes somebody sends in a question and I get really passionate and I rant kind of like that accent thing. So then I'll start writing and I'll put together an outline. But sometimes I'm like, what am I going to podcast on this week? So I'll go to the idea doc, I'll pull one of those topics and then I'll start writing the outline. And then I try to always sleep on the outline uh, before recording it for a solo show. And then I record the episode and then we transcribe the episode. And then I have um, a blogger who takes that transcription and creates the blog post version. This is a very expensive setup. And I am only able to afford to do this because I have patrons and I have a, a mature show. It's not how we did it when we first got started. For interview shows, <clears throat> I have a bank, like a vault of questions, like 40 questions. Like a, it's like a pantry of, of questions. Then I put together the meal of questions. So I, I will pick about 10 questions, probably about five or six from the vault, and then five or six specifically for that uh, guest. And then I try as hard as I can not to ask those questions. <laughs> uh, those questions are my safety net. I, I'm trying to, this is one area where I'm trying to grow as a podcast host, listen better and ask more follow-up questions and less questions from the list. But I do my preparation to have a good set of questions ahead of time so that I'm asking uh, good questions. Um, and then my third kind of episode that I do is the reverse interview. And for that, it doesn't require a lot of preparation because I don't know what, uh, but I do, I do a little bit of preparation, but the main preparation is I have a pretty in-depth application form. Somebody wants to come on the podcast and pick my brain for free. They, ha they have to fill out an application. They have to have a good microphone. So the, the work there is really putting together the application form. Um, I'm going to do a whole course on podcasting and how to have a podcast or how to start a podcast. I'm hoping to launch it in Q3 or Q4 of this year. Um, but in the meantime, I have that ep one episode on how to start a podcast, which you can listen to it for at first. Uh, J uh, Joanna asks, what's the babyest step do you recommend to Christian publishers venturing into podcasting? Um, well, the first babyest step is to listen to podcasts and get comfortable with listening to podcasts. That's the babyest step. Uh, the second, though, would be to get that podcasting mic and start coming on podcasts as a guest. What's great about that is that you come and then you're done. <laughs> as soon as the episode is over, you don't have to deal with any of the technical parts of uploading MP3 or editing it. Uh, so it's very, very easy from a technical perspective. Um, Ali asks, how is podcasting different slash better slash worse than your own YouTube channel? It reaches a different audience. Uh, podcast listeners are older and wealthier. Uh, on average than YouTube listeners. You're also able to reach people who are too busy to watch YouTube. Um, you, there's nothing, no reason though that you can't do both. Uh, so you can, in fact, Joe Rogan, who was for a time the number one podcaster before he stopped being a podcaster and sold his soul to Spotify. Um, he had his show as a podcast and he also had it as a YouTube video. Uh, so there's nothing keeping Lori from, you know, taking this audio and releasing it as a podcast. It's um, more, YouTube's more complicated. And a lot of people really struggle to get traction on YouTube. Uh, so YouTube seems easy because most of the videos that you watch are by popular YouTubers, but most YouTube videos don't get seen by anyone. Um, so it reaches different audiences. So what I would do is I would figure out where your people are, the people you're wanting to reach with your podcast or with your message or with your book find out if they listen to more YouTube or if they listen to more podcasts and then look and see how crowded it is. Because maybe they listen to more YouTube, but there's already six other YouTube channels that are doing exactly what you're doing and there's no other podcasts. And so in that case, you're like, well, gosh, if I start a podcast. I get all of the market of the podcast. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, strategy that goes in. Okay, Ida asks, aside from getting a mic, um, any other tips for creating a home studio? <clears throat> Uh, so one is to have carpet uh, or a rug in your room to uh, fight reflections. So reflections or echoes are kind of your biggest enemy. And so you want soft, fuzzy things in your room to absorb reflections. So some people, if they buy the wrong kind of microphone, there's a, a certain kind of microphone that you want to avoid. And a lot of people buy it 
because they get bad advice. And it's a it's called a condenser microphone. It's a the blue Yeti, blue Snowball are the most common uh, condenser microphones, and those are really sensitive to room reflections. And so, what often happens is people once they buy those microphones, they start having to do a lot of treatment to the room uh, to get the room quiet. Whereas if you're using a dynamic microphone, which is the kind that I recommend, that are actually cheaper, diamond, or they can be, uh, and they give you a better sound. Uh, dynamic microphones are what we use in radio. Uh, really, the only place where I recommend condenser microphones is when recording music in a music studio. And a lot of people get advice on microphones from their musician friends who tell them the mic they want to get for recording their guitar, not the best mic for recording voice for spoken word. Uh, but uh, these books behind me serve a double function. So they not only act as a backdrop, but books have really good acoustic properties in that they both block and absorb sound. So um, that would be my next tip for a home studio. All right. These questions are coming in as fast as I can answer them. <laughs> so, uh, so Lori, you just tell me when I'm five minutes from the end and I'll give my closing story, but other than that, I'll just keep answering questions. Um, so Charles asks, uh, are there any advantages or disadvantages when using paid podcasting hosting services as opposed to the free hosting services? So he who pays the piper calls the tune. And if you're using a free service, you are the product being sold, not the customer. And as Christians are getting more censorship around the world, uh, the ones who are experiencing it the most acutely are the ones on the free platforms. And so if you can afford a paid platform, I really recommend that you go with one because you're more secure. You're, you're less likely to have the rug ripped out from underneath you. Um, so the of the podcast hosts, the two that I recommend are, uh, if you're using WordPress and you're wanting the podcast to live inside of your WordPress website, Blueberry, is what I recommend, and that's who I use. And um, I have an affiliate coupon with them, actually. If you use coupon code Novel Marketing, you get a free month of hosting with them. If you're not hosting on WordPress, uh, I recommend Buzzsprout. Uh, they're actually run by Christians. It's like it's the top podcast host, <laughs> uh, pay, or one of the top paid podcast hosts. The guys who, I've met the guys who run it. Uh, I've also met the Blueberry guys. Those guys are great too. But the Blueberry, uh, sorry, yeah, um, Buzzsprout. Uh, they have a really strong platform. And I think they have a free level, but they start at, I want to say $12 a month, something like that. And um, they have some really good technology and they really make it very easy. So if you are technically savvy, uh, Blueberry gives you a lot of power with their Power Plus uh, plugin. But if you're not technically savvy, Buzzsprout makes it really easy. And I have links at authormedia.com for both of those services. But if you can afford it, I would avoid the free. Uh, I, I don't trust them. Uh, I, I do, we have this thing in America, cancel culture, where a lot of people are getting canceled because they have views that are outside of the mainstream. And Christians are really getting hit hard uh, with censorship in various areas. And I spend a lot of time helping authors with damage, damage control and damage mitigation when it comes to getting censored. And I know some of you are in countries that are even worse. Right. You're in a country where uh, Christianity is um, actively persecuted, not just by at the corporate level of the corporations, but also at the government level. And um, don't don't invite trouble if you can. <laughs> just pay for hosting. Um, pay for hosting from friends. All right, uh, Janet asks. Uh, my website is writeforareason.com with hyphens in between the words. It's for Christians new to writing novels for kids slash teens. Should I call it right for a reason for writing Christian fictions uh, for kids and teens? Um, that's a really long name. You're not going to want to say that name every episode. So what I would do is I'd create a title and a subtitle. So for me, I have, this is the Novel Marketing Podcast. That's the name of the show, Novel Marketing Podcast. But then I'd say, this is the show for writers who want to sell more books, build their platform, and change the world with writing worth talking about. So those are all my key keywords, so to speak. And that's in the description. I would keep your name short. Uh, I'd also uh, see if you can get right for a reason.com without the hyphens, because um, that doesn't convey well over audio. If somebody can't see your name, it's right hyphen for hyphen a hyphen reason.com. 
really difficult to say over and over again. Um, all right. Uh, what app do you use to transcribe or is it a manual transcription? Ah, great question, Edna. So um, there's two different apps that we use. For solo episodes and for older episodes, I use Happy Scribe. Uh, which has an AppSumo deal right now, actually, where you can get, I think, a lifetime of it for 50 bucks or something. It's really reasonable. Um, but uh, for most of our transcriptions, we use a tool called sonics.ai, which is a paid tool. You pay, I think it's $60 a year, and then you pay by the minute for the AI transcription. And what I like about Sonics is that you can upload multiple tracks. So we, since we're recording on Riverside, I have audio of just me, and I have audio of just the guest on two different wave files. And so I'm able to upload both wave files. And so it gives us a little bit more accurate of a transcription and it keeps the audio correctly assigned to the appropriate person. So we're not giving them credit for saying something that I said or, or vice versa. Because when the machine is doing the transcription, it can get you into trouble. Um, but we don't share that with anyone because AI transcription is not ready for prime time. <laughs> Uh, both of those services allow you to like click on a word and hear it to see if the transcription was correct and then you can go in and correct it. Uh, but even then we don't share it because transcription isn't the same as like actual sentence structure. So then we'll, we'll edit that into actual blog format. And that takes several hours. It, it's some work um, to do. Uh, but at the end, we have both a blog post and a podcast. And we have as many people, potentially sometimes more, read the blog post version as listen to the podcast version. All right. And that is all of the questions. That was 20 questions. <laughs> Thomas, I feel like we almost need to have a part two of this because <laughs> people are so engaged here. But Thomas, I want to, before you share your final story, I want to ask um, one more question that somebody had before this. Um, mm -hmm. They sent it in, Jenny. Um, are podcasts personality driven or can you have rotating hosts or what, what would you recommend in that way? So um, most podcasts are personality driven. Um, there's a saying in podcasting that people come for the guest or they come for the topic and they stay for the host. And they really want to feel that personal connection with you, which is why I made the big pivot to put my face on the art. And so both of my shows, you'll notice now have my face that that's new. I used to not have my face on anything because I'm like, why would anyone want to see my face? But it creates that greater personal connection uh, with the audience. And that's a really powerful. Um, there are podcasts that have multiple rotating hosts, but they typically have very large budgets. Um, so what I would do if I had multiple hosts, I would try to have one person who acted as the MC, maybe just doing a short introduction at the beginning and the end of the episode and then be like, you know, this is the kind of like what Lori did for this, right? So Lori introduced me, she came in at the end, she acted, she provided some structure. Um, it's not a good example because this is Lori's first time to do this, but you know, after Lori's been doing this for a year, you'll know Lori, you'll trust Lori and she'll give a sense of continuity to these monthly calls uh, that wouldn't happen if I had just come up and introduced myself. It would have felt very disjointed. But the fact that you saw Lori at the beginning um, or that you've historically been seeing Ramon every time, that gives it a, a sense of continuity. And it's and it's Lori's personality that's going to carry this, right? And her curation, right? Hope if she picks good guests, and uh, you'll want to come back. And if she doesn't, then you're not going to want to come back. And it's the same as with a podcast host. So yeah, that personality is, is a really important part. And I think it's it's especially true with podcasting because it's so intimate. They hear your voice. It's, they're not seeing your words, which is more separated. Uh, they're hearing your voice and they're imagining you in their head, what you look like. And that's yeah. that's even more intimate than them seeing your face because <laughs> you're not in front of their head. You're inside their head. <laughs> it's like there's no more intimate place than that. Um uh, and so, yeah, the personality is really important. And I encourage you to let your personality out. And I, I realize that can be intimidating. It was hard for me, you know, but I've been talking more about my family uh, and being more my, trying to be my whole self uh, on the show and uh, been getting, and that came from listener feedback. And I'd ask the listeners, I'd be at a conference and they'd say, oh, I listen to your podcast. I you know, really like it. I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, what could I do to make it better? What, what would you like to hear more of on the podcast? I, think, I hear more about your personal life. I'm like, really? <laughs> 
<laughs> How about nobody care about my personal life? But people do. They care about you as a as a human, especially after they've been listening to your voice for several hours. Yeah, Thomas, that's very helpful. And just to be clear, Ramon is going to keep doing these. I'm not going to people. So so don't worry, you guys. Oh, I sorry. I didn't love, mean to love Ramon. <laughs> so we don't. <laughs> We're going to keep Ramon doing what he's doing great at. Um, so but Thomas, why don't you wrap up with your final story? And then um, and also, is there will there be a way for people to access any of your slides? Um, we'll send out links for everybody with uh, I've been taking notes. And so we'll send out links with some of the recommendations that you've had as well. But is there any way to access your slides? Or is it too big of a file that that's not going to happen? It's easier to just watch the replay. And okay. the slides only make a little bit of sense if you're not yeah. hearing me explain yeah. them. Okay, so. good. All right, good. <clears throat> All right, final story. Yeah, uh, is about Mignon Fogarty. She was a technical writer and uh, with a passion for proper English usage. And so she was like, you know what? I'm tired of seeing the same grammatical errors over and over again. And so she started a podcast called Grammar Girl. Quick and dirty tips to clean up your writing. And if you'd have asked me, hey, there's gonna be this podcast, it's gonna be about grammar. I'd be like, okay, it's probably not gonna be that popular of a podcast, but it turned out to be incredibly popular, not just with you know, writers, but also with students and people learning English. And it became in this sensation, millions of downloads from around the world. So popular that literary agents called her and said, hey, have you ever thought about writing a book based off of your podcast? And she's like, I guess. So they got her a publishing deal. And they came out with a book, Grammar Girls, Quick and Dirty, Dirty Tips for Better Writing. Uh, almost the exact same title as her podcast. And this book about grammar from this otherwise unknown person became a New York Times bestselling book. And now it's like Skunk and White's Elements of Style and Grammar Girls, some of the top bestselling books on grammar. She went from being a complete unknown to having one of the top books on English grammar. She got there with her podcast. And... I would love it if you were my next case study with your book and with your podcast. Thank you very much for listening and live long and prosper. <laughs> oh, Thomas. Thomas, did you also have, is there any RS, thoughts on RSS feed? I know you mentioned <coughs> that. And um, anything we should know about that quickly before we wrap up? So if uh, the two hosts that I recommended, um, Blueberry and Buzzsprout, both um, manage the RSS feeds in slightly different ways. So Blueberry, the RSS feeds lives on your website, uh, which I really like. I like having full control over the RSS feed on my website, but that also requires a little bit more responsibility. Um, and so you just submit that RSS feed URL to iTunes or sorry, Apple Podcasts and Spotify and the other directories one time. It takes about 30 minutes. Sometimes you have to create an account. Um, but once you're submitted and accepted, those services will check the RSS feed every 30 minutes or six hours and look for a new episode. So it's not immediate, uh, yeah. but then they see the new episode, they'll pull in the new episode. Uh, Buzzsprout hosts the RSS feed on their server. So they host both the MP3s and they host the RSS feed, uh, which means that you don't have to worry about it as much. You just log into Buzzsprout and update, upload your MP3, and they, they take it from there. Uh, so they're a little bit easier to use, and uh, but you also have a little bit less control. But the reason why I recommend them is that I trust them. <laughs> They're not going to just like pull the rug from under you because, you know, you're preaching some part of the, of the Bible that's controversial. That's yeah. not their, not their way. Well, and I can add that. Um, and we'll, we'll include a note to, to uh, a link to Buzzsprout, but I can, I can testify that with my podcast, Thomas, I use Buzzsprout and you have to, with the RSS, you have to like, there's an initial, um, prompt to sign up for Spotify or all these, you know, get it distributed to where it needs to go. But then otherwise, it's great. So I would yep. recommend that as well. Um, so thanks, Thomas. This was really informative and our, our um, <laughs> listeners are really engaged, which is great. And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this. And tomorrow it will be, the video will be available on our YouTube channel. So you guys can find that on our website, a link to that, or just search Media Associates International on YouTube and you can subscribe to our channel there. All of the past webinars are located there as well as our One Big Idea weekly videos series that we have. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at Media Associates International and um, Thomas, maybe through social media, right? <laughs> and um, thanks for joining us, you all. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>